I want to welcome everybody to the 2018-19 colloquium season. Um, I'm delighted to uh, say that this year we are finally celebrating the beginning of our STEM ed PhD program. And to do that, <laughs> several people in this room spent a lot of time working on that. Um, to celebrate that, this year's <laughs> talks will focus on trying to understand what is this thing that we call STEM education. And when I started thinking about people to talk this year, the very first person who came to my mind was Janet Klotner. Um, Janet has been, um, she's done a, a tremendous number of things. She's a cognitive scientist who worked in the computer science department at an engineering school. Um, then she went to the National Science Foundation for a while, and now she's helping to develop a master's in learning engineering. So she's, she's crossed over a whole bunch of domains and lived as a true STEM person across those domains for a very long time. Um, Janet's research focuses on learning from experience and how to foster that learning. She started um, designing middle school science curriculum in the 1990s that immerses middle schoolers in scaffolded learning experiences that benefit from technology. And um, out of that came the learning by design approach um, that she's very well known for in the literature. She is currently working on um, Harvard's EcoMove for middle school classrooms and understanding how to design virtual worlds that support deep learning, motivation, and sustained engagement. Janet was a founding director of Georgia Tech's EduTech Institute. She's the founding editor and um, editor-in-chief of the Journal of the Learning Sciences, which is um, one of the biggest journals, most respected journals in education. Um, she served as I, the International Society of Learning Sciences first executive officer and was a program officer at the National Science Foundation, where she helped to develop the cyber learning programs that are still um, being funded there now. And today, she's here to talk to us about students being drawn into science through mystery and awe. Thank you. So, good thing you went on for so long because I touched something and it stopped working. <laughs> so, uh, I'm happy to be here. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> how do I start? What I want to tell you is that I'm not working on any research right now. This is this is research that I was doing. Well, I, got, I want to write this paper, but so I'm going to be working on it soon. But um, I'm not working on any research right now. Um, as Chandra said, I'm at the um, I'm at Boston College in their Lynch School of Education, and I've been working on putting curriculum together in what we're calling learning engineering. So learning engineering means um, taking all these things that we know about how people learn and how to foster learning and um, and using that to, I mean, helping people learn, learning engineering means using that in order to design experiences for learners, technology rich experiences for learners, and use technology in ways that, uh, that make sense. So that's what I've been doing. That's kind of like, well, it's a nice, you know, this point in my career thing to be doing. Um, what I was doing before that was I was at the Concord Consortium. And um, any of you familiar with the Concord Consortium? They do, um, they design a lot of uh, learning technologies. I mean, that's what they do. They get almost all of their money from the National Science Foundation. Um, and they've got a lot of people who are, uh, um, who know learning in some discipline and they, um, and they design technologies for learning science, math, and some engineering. And um, my particular interest when I went there was in doing some super huge project that I never figured out how to do. But what I did do <laughs> was, um, I, uh, the, I don't know, there was, I had some interest in finding out, um, I'll, 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 uh, I'll go back to my, to my title in a, in a moment. I had some interest in finding out, like if we're using if students are learning actively through project -based, in a project-based way, project-driven way, so they're solving problems, they're addressing design challenges, they're, they're doing, doing project work, what does it take? I mean, you got one project, another project, another project, another project. What does it take to foster knowledge integration across projects, the 
interdisciplinary topics that are in, in across projects and maybe even across disciplines. I'm going to show you my example and then I'm going to go back to my to my first page for a moment. Okay, so here's my aspirational example. You can't see it. Don't worry about it. I'll read it to you. Okay. Students are exploring ecosystems using this piece of software called EcoMove. I'll introduce it to you in a moment. Basically, uh, I'll introduce it to you now. Basically, it's a virtual world where um, you get to move around in the environment in a lot of different ways. Um, um, and um, and it's, in, it's a pond ecosystem, okay? And there mm -hmm. are bunches of kinds of fish in the pond, and there are all kinds of trees, and there's vegetation. In trees around it, there's vegetation, there's a golf course to the side, there's a, there's a housing development, uh, uh, various other things in its environs. A um, bunch of birds, other animals <coughs> that, are, um, that are around it. And uh, in fact, um, pretty quickly into making your way around this virtual world, um, you find out that the big fish in the pond all died off. You also get to move around in time in it. They all died off. And so what the students need to do is to explain why the large fish in the pond died off. And you know, they discovered it, they get very excited about it, and they want to do it. So, but, but here's my, but, but going along with my aspirational example, or, or let me tell you. So, so in order to do that, they have to worry, they have to think about a lot of different things. What activities are people engaging in around the pond? What kind of flora and fauna are in and around it? How many of each of the types are they finding there? How's that changing over time? Um, how well formed or deformed or energetic are the you know are, are, are the are the animals? Um, maybe what's the chemical makeup of the water? The concentration of different chemicals? How oxygenated is it? I mean, if you're trying to figure out why fish died, there are an awful lot of things. Um, how does the existence of each of the species in the environment affect the existence of the other ones? Okay, how's the weather been? Is that, could that something had to do with the weather? So uh, the, the golf course. Um, so lots of different things that they might think about as, as they're doing that. <coughs> and now, um, later in the year, they're challenged to identify sources of poor air quality and make recommendations about addressing air quality problems in their community. Okay, so it's a seemingly completely different problem. They're not going to use the computer for this one. Um, but, you know, they're both about ecosystems, right? And they're both in some way about poison pollution, you know. So having figured out what killed off the fish, they know some things about how systems interact with each other, and they've experienced chemicals running off into a body of water and that having an impact. In fact, far away and having an impact. So now they're working on the air quality challenge and what do they have to do with this one? They have to determine human impact and natural impact on air quality. Of course they can, if they remember the, you know, if they remember the, the, the EcoMove example, they remember human, that there was human impact and there were natural impacts and they all kind of came together to kill off the fish. Okay. Um, um, the impact of bad air quality on ecosystems, the humans living there, the flow of matter in the atmosphere, sources of pollutants, how air quality changes over time. And then also in this one, they're learning some things about <coughs> molecular formulas and unstable molecules and chemical <coughs> reactions. They didn't really learn those things in the other one, okay, in the first one. So um, now having worked on the air quality challenge, Okay, they know some things about chemistry that might help them achieve a better understanding of what happened in the pond ecosystem. Okay, so now what's possible? Okay, what's possible if they're interested enough and if they remember enough, that's the big ifs, right? Okay, um, about the ecosystems challenge, they have the opportunity to connect the two challenges, to connect life sciences content and chemistry content to deepen their understanding of systems and their interactions. And like all kinds of things that we talked about, that, 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 that went on in both of them about human impacts and natural impacts. And um, I mean, part, you know, that's part of the systems, of the systems that are going on, but they have all that opportunity to do that. Okay, so that's, as I say, aspirational. Okay, it might happen in some places, 
Okay, but my question is, and what I'm interested in is, how do you make that happen? Okay, and this is essentially a design problem to me. Um, now I'm going back to my I'm going back to my my um, my my title here, okay? Because um, it might or might not match that aspirational example that I told you about. So what I want to tell you now is that I'm going to tell you two stories. Okay, I'm going to tell you a tale of what we learned about how mystery and awe can foster curiosity about the real world. Okay, and I'm going to tell you a tale about research methodology. <laughs> so, in fact, we collected data to learn about if they're interested enough and remember enough. Okay, and I, you know, and and I'll, and, and these are the. And these are the questions we started with. What do they remember about their project experiences? What influences what they remembered? I mean, there are all kinds of things that can influence what they remembered. You know, um, um, a dog biting them you know, like when they were thinking about something, right? But 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 we want the ones we want the ones that will happen in the normal educational environment, uh, the good educational environment. You know, um, whether it's formal or informal. Um, and what, so what influences what they remember? What influences the richness and the connectedness of those memories that they have? What would make them interested enough to want to make connections between their experiences? Okay, and then, you know, after we know some things about this and we make it work, then there's, of course, research we can do on how does understanding develop when learners are helped to make these kinds of connections that in that aspirational example. I mean, it's a great example, great aspirational example. So, um, so those are the questions we started out with, but those questions don't answer the title of the talk. So, um, so the methodological, um, you know, the methodological tale I'm going to tell is how we got from this to telling you to to learning a whole lot of things about drawing kids into science. Okay. I mean, it's certainly related to this, but it goes beyond it. Okay, so let me tell you our foundations because I think that that's important to both tales that I'm going to tell. Um, our conceptual foundations are like really, really broad. Okay, there are a lot of them. So, um, so that you look at the aspirational example, and what you're seeing in there is a transfer example. Okay, using, you're seeing actually what you saw in that was several different examples of transfer. Okay, using what's learned in one situation in order to better understand another situation. Um, then the aspiration is that they'll go back to the first situation based on the second one and add some things to their understanding there. Okay, um, the particular I, I, I'm not going to tell you about everything that's wrong with transfer, um, with transfer studies. Um, the, none of the transfer studies that the, the the everyday transfer studies that you will read about will tell you anything about how you make that trans those two transfer things I just talked about work. Okay, um, but there are two approaches to transfer that taking them seriously. Um, would help us to understand that. Okay, one of them is preparation for future learning. The other one is an, taking an actor-oriented perspective to studying transfer. So uh, Dan Schwartz and John Bransford were the first people to talk about <coughs> preparation for future learning. Um, and Schwartz and his students have done a tremendous amount of research on it since then. So um, uh, they mean something narrower than I do by it, but but I'll but but let me tell you the, the general idea. Okay, the general idea is that, um, that uh, if people have experiences with something beforehand, okay, and that get them wondering about interactions and get them recognizing what interactions and what difficulties are there, they have enough experience with something to be able to start asking questions about it, basically. Okay, then when they get into the situation in which they have the opportunity to learn about it, they'll be more ready to learn. Okay, that's basically in a nutshell what it says. I, it, there's a lot more, but that's for our purposes, that's enough for now. 
The actor-oriented transfer perspective, Joanne Lobato, um, who works in math education, so you guys may know her of her. Um, she says, if you really want to understand transfer, you really want to understand, and, and both of these are talking about transfer as being a process happening over time. It's not just something that all of a sudden is there. Okay. Um, she says, if you really want to understand what's going on with transfer, you've got to look at these situations from the point of view of the people who are taking part in them. Don't think that you can look over the top and you can say, okay, if people are in this situation, then they ought to be able to do this because it doesn't work that way. I mean, all the transfer literature says it doesn't work that way. They never get any results, but mostly they don't budge from it. They just say transfer is hard. Okay. She says, she says, let's look at how it actually happens. Okay. And she suggests some things to keep track of as you're doing observations. Keep track of, uh, oh, you know, she has a list of four and I don't remember what they are, but, but, but things like um, other conversations going on at the same time that might be overheard, the teacher's instructions, um, um, the interactions with the purposeful interactions with others. Uh, I don't remember what else. Okay, keep track of those and so you can trace where somebody's <laughs> learning, where somebody's ability to apply something learned in one situation and another is coming from. What's happening along the way that's giving them, giving them hints, right? That's giving them hints, that's helping them to deepen what they know, what's happening along the way. Um, what I forgot to say earlier is, I had in notes here, but I didn't look, um, is that these foundations have three purposes, by the way. So they, they fit both of my stories, right? They give partial answers, answers about how to achieve, some of them give partial answers about how to achieve that aspiration, okay? Um, and, and how to set the context, right? For achieving that aspiration and for answering those questions. Um, they help us know what data to collect and they help us know, they can help us know how to, how to analyze it. So in my discussion of these two, you, it, it's about, you know, what do we need to make happen and what data do we need to collect? How are we going to, how are we going to analyze it? Um, um, I think I'll skip case-based reasoning for now. I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I know I'll say something about it. it it's mine. Um, case-based reasoning as a, as an anchor, as a foundation says that the better we can, it, it's about learning from experience. The better we can extract out connections between things in an experience, the better able we'll be able to reuse um, what we learn. So if, if it's not just pieces, but you're explaining why things happened the way they did, then remembering that experience will be much, when you remember it, it'll be much more usable, okay, than if you haven't made all those connections. Um, knowledge integration, Marsha Lynn, one of her <coughs> students and postdocs, okay, pretty much says that, um, that yeah, our knowledge is in pieces and, um, you know, to do those kinds of integrations, even to make this transfer happen, what we need to do is to be doing a lot of integration of the things that are, are you know, not quite, not quite the same thing. Okay, so we have knowledge in pieces that needs to be integrated to create coherent understanding. And that requires activating prior knowledge and help with the integration. So this is saying something about what has to go on in the learning environment in order for that for those connections to be made the, uh, the, the aspirational connections to be made okay then project-based problem-based and design-based learning you know each one of those tells us some things about how to scaffold to facilitate um the learning experiences so that learners will learn from their project from their project um, experiences and then um there's literature on intrinsic motivation that tells us something about how you keep people engaged over time. Okay, so um, so those are the foundations, and as I said, they're the foundations for um, the foundations for how we would design if we were designing something, but we're using somebody else's somebody else's software here, um, and they're foundations for what should we look for. 
as we're going through and trying to answer our questions. So here's what we thought we would do. You can all laugh as soon as you read it. That's fine. Our whole advisory committee laughed. Okay. We set it up like an example. The learners would engage in a project. Um, then they get, you know, where everything's right for being able to do this. <coughs> Not everything. But some things are right for being able to do this kind of um, of, of transfer. Um, they'd um, um, they then engage in another related project in another area. They have the scaffolding they need to make the connections between the two. And we collect data in both situations to know about their experiences um, in the second situation to see you know, what they remember from the first. And, um, and they want to make connections. Okay, And we'd also interview them to find out more about that. We'd use the data to answer our questions. And we do all this um, in a computer virtual world, set of virtual worlds, and also using units for my middle school curriculum, project-based inquiry science. Um, and as I said, at, you know, this is like a, I don't know, at least a five-year project, and we had $300,000 less, about a year and a quarter. So um, not enough time, not enough money. Um, so we couldn't do that. You know, I mean, we were, we we're gonna, so we, we did something else. They told us we had to use, our advisory board said, use the computer. It's gonna be about the computer in the future. You wanna find out about the computer, you can collect data that way, do it that way. Forget about using the other units. They're also, they're too long. You don't wanna be in the classroom that much. Um, I was very, very happy to have my, some of those people on the list were on my, uh, the foundations were, were on my, um, were on my committee. Joanne Lobato and Dan Schwartz were particularly helpful, but there were a few other people who were also. Um, so here's what we decided to do. We would observe two sixth grade classes as they addressed the challenge in an engaging virtual world, happened to be EcoMove, okay, over a two week period. Um, we'd record their experiences over those weeks um, in field notes, video, audio, screencasts, teachers and peers going on around them. Um, and um, so we'd know, we'd be able to trace back you know, what they why they remembered the things that they remembered. Um, we'd also interview pairs of learners who were working together. They worked in pairs. We'd interview pairs of learners uh, who worked together to find out what they remembered, what they were able to do with what they remembered, and, um, you know, what interested them about the experience. Okay. And, um, and then we would extract out what they remembered, um, you know, when we, when they, when we, when we interviewed them. Okay, our interviews had two parts. One of them was the second in, first interview was finding out about the kids and what they remembered about the experience. And the second um, interview was about asking them to resolve the problem of the fish dying and then also to engage in a few what ifs. So we could get to see what they what they what they remembered. Um, and then we would extract out what they remembered and what they became excited about or interested in and we'd analyze to find out why. Okay. And if you remember, we wanted to find out what students remember and why and what engages them as they address a challenge in a virtual world. Now, um, I can tell you the punchline of the story right now, okay? Because um, the title of the talk, you know, is all about affect, right? It's all about being, it's hot cognition, right? It's all about being drawn in and really caring, okay? And what's this? This is cold cognition, right? This is about what do we remember and what's interesting. But it's not about jumping up and down, you know, getting excited about something. So the, the, um, before I show you EcoMove, I will tell you the punchline is that we found out lots of things about this. But in fact, we also saw that the kids were jumping up and down excited about all kinds of stuff. And that was so much more interesting than answering those questions. I'll tell you the answer to those questions. So let me show you a little bit about EcoMove. So EcoMove is a virtual world. It's computer simulation. A virtual world is a computer simulation and animation of an environment. It could be a real environment or an imaginary one. This one happens to be real. Um, it's somewhere in Cambridge, pond somewhere in Cambridge. They call it Shield Pond. I don't know what real pond it is. Um, and um, 
the use uh, the, no the fish dying off I don't think is real I think that that part of it is imaginary um the the users I should say learners are immersed in the world and have the opportunity to navigate within it and explore it and do things that you can do in the world they couldn't change anything but they could they could they could observe and watch what was going on and they could do that across time um there are two ways to to that there are a lot of ways to navigate the world the two ways to be in the world one is um that you can watch yourself your avatar moving through the world so that's kind of a third person perspective and the other is and i don't have any pictures of it you can see the world through the avatar's eyes so that's more like a first person um, um, look at it i don't know that that makes a difference i can tell you that now i i mean i suspect that even this way as third person it's like first person enough that there's something very engaging about it that 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 goes beyond just watching something but i i don't I, I, I mean, just watching something on the screen, but I, but I don't, I don't know. Um, um, so uh, what you see over on this side, I know you can't see them, but what you see over on this side are a bunch of tools. Okay, so they have available to them. I don't know if I have the a picture. Here we go. Oh, that's not how it works. Um, so uh, here's a better view it's not as big but what you can see is that there are a bunch of tools across here and uh, this came up because uh, this toolbox was highlighted okay and these are a bunch of tools for measuring things around about the water the water temperature the concentrations of different things um, in it um, <coughs> phosphates and nitrates um, um, how oxygenated it is um, I don't remember what else. Okay, and there are other tools too. There's a, um, and I'll tell you about moving around in it. There's a submarine tool. You get where well, I don't, I can't see well enough to see where it is here. But um, you get in the submarine, you get to, you, you see it go underwater. Okay, magic. And um, then you can tell it how deep you want to go, and you can look at the underworld, underwater world with several different magnification so here's a view from the um summary um with this i don't know what it is some kind of worm and it's um magnified i don't know a hundred times a thousand times I'm, i you know i really don't know um so you can go underwater in the um in the submarine um there is another tool that's a calendar I don't know, it might be this. There's another tool that's a calendar. You go to the calendar and you tell it what date you want to move it to. So you do some time travel. Okay, and then you can open up this box and you can do a toolbox and you can measure everything about the water in those, in those days. Um, once you've collected data, you can, um, you can see it in a chart form or you can, um, you can graph it and you can tell it which data you want to see. Um, this is too small for me to see too small for me to see what it is but um but probably this is the fish dying off and you see that you know they're they're gone over here well they're, they're gone over here um we, there's probably oxygen in the water somewhere um probably this is oxygen in the water it goes way down um Probably uh, this is maybe nitrates or phosphates in the water. I'm not sure. Um, and uh, I don't know. I don't think that the minnows are, are, are here because the minnows go way up at the end because the big fish aren't eating them anymore. Okay. Um, you can also, you, you make yourself walk around here. Um, they're exploring. As I said, there's a let me see, there's a golf course way over here, and there's a, um, a new subdivision going in over here, and uh, um, there's a sewer, there's a bridge and a road, and there's a sewer pipe, so there are all kinds of things that might play a role. It's really, it's really quite, it's really quite nice. Okay, so, um, so that's what the kids are doing, and uh, I, the other thing, next thing about 
uh, I want to tell you is about our methodology. Um, I, I already told you that what we were going to do was to um, you know, record their experiences using this and interview them and extract things out. So I just want to tell you a little bit about the interviews. Um, as I said, interview one is about them and their experience. We asked things, we started out asking them things like, what did you enjoy? What was, what was most interesting? What was most surprising? What were you proud of? What was challenging? If you were remaking EcoMove, how would you improve it? They wanted multiple missions, a lot of them wanted multiple missions. They wanted to be able to go back and be able to do something where they could save the fish. I, I, they had a lot of really good ideas about it. I mean, I, I mean, you know, in the first interview asking these questions, we were getting this inkling that there was something more going on than this cold stuff that we, that we were going for. Um, we then asked them to show us around in the in the system, just to walk walk around the system, and they're in the same pairs that they were in in the classroom. Um, show us what helped you figure out what happened. What are your favorite things? Did you have trouble with anything? Was anything challenging? You know, show us. And then we just asked them some questions about themselves. Have you ever been any place like this pond? Tell us about it. Do you play video games? So you know, so there's a set of questions about the environment and a set of questions about their experience with. Um, other technology like this. Um, what's your favorite thing to do in those games and how are they like an unlike eco move? And then anything else they want to tell us, I don't remember if anybody told us anything more. Second interview, um, which would be more relevant if I were telling you about what they learned, um, was uh, really was about what they learned. And um, we asked them to go back and explain um, to us again what happened to the fish. They each gave a presentation at the end of the of the two weeks. Um, nobody got very close. I mean, there's some issues with the software. They've been rebuilding it since then. Some issues with the software in terms of what the kids actually learn. Um, but everybody was pretty happy with what they were able to do. Okay, I should tell you that. Everybody was pretty happy with what they were able to do. And everybody got little pieces of it. Nobody was able to put it all together. And, and we and we asked them some what ifs, so extending extending it. And this gave us a chance not just to know what they learned, but to see um, what they remembered, what they were able to do. I mean, this is part of their memories too, right? What they were able to do with respect to the scientific practices they were learning. So even though I can't tell you that they learned a lot of content, I can tell you that in terms of the scientific practices that they were learning about and the things that they knew they should take into account, you know, we saw, we saw, we saw that happen too. Um, a new version of Java is available. I'm glad that's not showing on there. So I know you can't read this, but let me tell you about some of the kids. So I spent a lot of time this morning going from T1, B3, to actually putting names on them. I didn't remember where all my files were to get the names out anymore, but I found them. Okay, so Jason and Umika, oh, they're all sixth graders. Um, um, Jason and Umika said, I'm not going to tell you the questions they answered, just telling you some of the things they said. The, the summary, finding the chlorophyll, it was fun to experiment and find information and see it in a graph. They liked looking at the graphs and the animal populations and what they ate and looking at living things and talking to the characters, the character scientist person, for example. There's some avatars in there who helped them out. They liked watching the animal populations go down and up like prey and food. You could see it in the graphs and predict what was going to happen. Okay. Um, you could go into the water and look at the different animals. Oh my God, how like one little organism in the water could affect the population of the whole line of animals. We were proud we were able to collect a lot of information about how the fish died. Okay. The other ones are, 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 are much more, more energetic than that. Deanna and Amber, um, well, this one is. Um, so they said they, they really appreciated how it looks like the real world. There's so many animals and there's a field guide that gives you information about all the different animals. These guys really like to find out about the animals. How the problem that happened was human based. Like, the fish died because the people did something. One thing in real life I really liked, if we want to protect the fish, we can make sure that the surroundings are good for fish to survive. So taking it into her real world. 
Um, and she really likes, they really like seeing the microscopic objects. I don't know why I didn't put more here, but I didn't. Um, Andre and Amara, I put a lot here about them. Um, they said, we saw different animals interacting with each other in different organisms. There were many kinds of things that could have killed the fish. The summary was really neat, because like when you zoom in all the way, you think, see things that you cannot see from regular eyesight. We saw these little worms floating around, lots of organisms, beetles and bugs talking to people, getting information. And oh my god, there was this microscopic organism in the sea and ocean and ponds. I never thought I would ever see anything like that. Right? Like I saw a centipede. Oh, that maybe was a centipede I showed you. It was really long and squiggly and looked like one of those poisonous ones. When you go in the ocean, it's even like if you go to swim in the, in the ocean, that's cool seeing the crabs on the floor. So when you see these tiny, tiny organisms, it was really cool. Okay, they liked how realistic it was. Um, and then um, Andre, who was not a student, said, I'm not gonna lie. The game gave me ideas, like next time I go to the beach, I'm gonna to try to see how far underwater I can go to see what it looks like. I'm gonna scoop a little bit of water and like test, test it out. And then uh, Amara, who's more students, said, I constantly found myself trying to look at information in the graph and was very excited about that. It was so cool because one animal's information led to why another animal's information made sense. I was like an expert or something. It was cool to go to the class and present. The project brought us together as friends, they said. Um, I would, and then they, they would have made it even more realistic. So these are some examples of what we heard. You're welcome to ask questions, by the way. I'm sorry, I should have said that earlier. <laughs> so like I said before, what they remembered was not surprising. Okay, they remembered the things that were fun and the details of those. They remembered, I didn't show you any arguments, but I, there, I didn't show you the examples from people who got in big arguments with some people around them. Um, the, are, the things they argued with each other about and the ideas they argued about, they remembered. They remembered the science and science practices that they learned or developed in the process of doing this and that they used, the ones that they used, as you might expect. Um, then there were these surprises and explanations about the surprises and, you know, like the fact that one little organism could do so much damage, that people could do things, you know, to affect the, affect the world like that. I mean, these are some of their surprises, you know? I mean, they were big surprises. But remember what was difficult, what they enjoyed. Oh, those were the experiences of awe and wonder and what they learned from those. Yeah. Um, how did it, did they collaborate beyond the peers? Um, they did. The teacher would, uh, there, there were a couple different ways. Um, there were two pairs at each table. They were uh, slightly, no, their tables were about this size. And there were two pairs at each table. So they saw what the people next to them were doing, and they talked to the people next to them. Um, the tables were pretty close together, so sometimes they talked to the people in front or in back of them. I mean, just informally, right? Um, we had an instance where, I didn't show you one of these, but we had an instance where two kids in the class were cousins. So they were very competitive with each other. And you know, one of them was here in the second row, and one of them was there in the first row. And, um, they had a lot of interactions. I guess my question was, well, my question was, did they collect different data and collect it oh, together, or did they oh. all try to collect their own? Well, data? that's what the um, Harvard people would have said to do. Um, it didn't work out that way. They did start out collecting different data. They started out um, with roles. I didn't tell you anything that happened in the classroom, I'm sorry. They started out with different roles. Some, well, they started out just exploring. And then they broke up and took on different roles. There were water chemists. There were um, um, investigators who talked to the people. Um, there were uh, people who specialized in animals, I guess. I, I, I don't remember what else. But there were, there were four different roles that they took on. Um, and they collected the data for those. But things didn't go as quickly as they needed them to go. And, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So at some point they just got all the data, all had all the data, were given all the data. So when they were collecting data, let's say they were collecting on nitrates, were they were just collecting data on nitrate, or were they able to make connections that a nitrate will affect an algal bloom or something? Like well, they weren't making that connection yet. When they were collecting the data, they weren't. But they could. But you saw the graphs. Yeah. Right. So the graphs are, the, the graphs are really nice. They leave out some things about time. 
And the kids, um, I mean, they are over time, but the gaps are big between the times that, that are on there. And, um, and the kids, turned out, didn't really understand time on the graphs very well. But, um, but, but, they, but they were able to do things like with the graphs and say, oh, look, the nitrites, nitrates were way up before the fish died, and then they were way down. And then they could make so they pattern they, recognition. They were doing a lot of pattern recognition. Yeah, a lot of that. What else can I tell you about about context? I'm sorry, I missed that. Anything else? Um, so, uh, so these are things they remembered. Um, I really need to write about that. It, it, I don't know. It's it's just you know it's just not. There's nothing. There's nothing really surprising, right? Um, probably when I move theory into it, it could get more surprising. But I, I told you the punchline already. What was really interesting was that after just two weeks of using EcoMove, I should say they were doing they were doing um, learning about ecology and ecosystems for four weeks before they used EcoMove. Again, that's not what the Harvard people would have told them to do, but I, we didn't have control over that. So they learned a lot of stuff about carrying capacity and food chains, and I, I don't know what they learned about nitrates and, and phosphates. I don't remember, but they learned a lot of things about about a lot about those things, um, and um, um, in those two in those four weeks, and then they were using this. Okay, they were there were a couple problem kids in the class. We didn't have we didn't have the um, permission to interview them, so we don't know anything about them. But they all showed, the, all the ones that we, that we, almost all the kids, whether we were, you know, talking to them, watching them or not, showed genuine interest in the phenomena in this environment. Oh, and to answer your question about the other ways that they interacted with each other, the teacher had them report what they saw, report what their ideas, their hypotheses, and their justifications for them um, along the way and share them with each other. So, um, so that I mean that that's you'd want that to happen in a class, right? Um, I was glad the teacher did that. Um, she had she did that, and that and that was something that I, and that, and they got. There was one day I wasn't there, but what was reported to me, um, I don't think I saw the video of it. What was reported to me is that, that that one day when I wasn't there, they started the whole class, one of the classes started having this big argument about what it was that killed the fish in the end. Was it lack of oxygen or were they, or was it bacteria, right? And everybody apparently was part of that discussion. So um, they did, they, they, they were passionate. I mean, even before we did the interviews, we knew they were passionate. Um, and they all, they all um, at, at the last day, they all gave their, um, you know, gave their presentation about what they think, what killed the fish. And the, and the two days after that, the teacher told them what was happening, what had happened. Um, the Harvard people said, oh no, the teacher should never do that. But I can tell you, <laughs> but I can tell you that it made a difference in the interest of several of them to actually know. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll get to that afterwards. Um, if I don't talk about that, remind me to. Okay. Um, um, I just already told you that they passionately engage in substantial and sophisticated explanation or argumentation. And it not only, I mean, it, and it wasn't just because the teacher told them to. They did. Um, some raised questions about became interested in investigating actual water environments. You saw that in one of the examples I show you, showed you. All, you saw that in two of the examples. Maybe it was in two. Was it at least? It was in two. I don't know if I showed you one of them. And almost all continued to be interested in reasoning about the eco-move environment. Some were quite interested in exploring other ecosystems. Okay, um, so our interviewing had included learning a whole lot about who these guys were, um, what they found so compelling. So we thought we had the data available to help us understand these results that are really about being drawn in. Okay, so these are the questions that we asked. Um, why did students become so substantially interested in this world and this challenge? 
I, the one reason you might give is that this is one of those schools where it's not exactly lecture, but um, you wouldn't love it. Um, it it's close to lecture. Um, and, and they were actually given a lot of autonomy in this. Mm -hmm. And then the, yeah, this, this will be part of my analysis. The computer su pl supplied some support for that. Um, so why did they become so substantially interested in this world and this challenge? And I think I, I, I think I can say that it wasn't simply because they were let loose, okay, that there were other things that went along with that, okay? Um, the realism of eco-moves seemed to be a big part of the answer to this question here. So <clears throat> we wanted to know what made it so real. Um, almost all of them willingly and purposefully engaged in scientific practices and scientific reasoning with us in the interviews two weeks or three weeks later. I mean, they were still engaged. They wanted to talk about it. They wanted to tell us about it, okay? Um, and the unit was over. They'd taken the test, you know, they knew what they got on it, and they were still engaging. Um, and you saw that some of them wanted to explore the real world more closely. So what made some of them want to explore the real world more closely? I, I, I forget the fact that what they were planning to do was so naive. That, that doesn't really matter. <laughs> the important thing is that they, that they were excited. So we took our data and we went about answering these questions. So we identified for each student what had initially drawn them in to willingly engage with eco move and what kept them motivated over the two-week period. Um, uh, at, oh, and we also looked at when kids got unmotivated, what brought them back, okay? Um, what had engaged their curiosity while addressing the challenge and what they had shown excitement about during class, um, what they had showed excitement about and wanted to discuss during the interviews, okay? And then we traced through the data from the point of view of each of the students to identify what had given rise to that engagement, interest, or excitement. I have a lot, a lot of, of Excel spreadsheets with me. You probably don't want to look at them, but I'll just tell you that we did. I want to introduce you to some of the kids. So um, basically, we're working on writing a paper about this, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six things we have in a chart. I didn't put the sixth one. Um, what, who are they? Who are the priors? You know, who are they coming into this that affected what would affect what they would get excited about? It would affect their engagement. Um, what drew them in? What kept them in? What delights and surprises did they, did they encounter? Okay. How did the changes in science attitudes, what were the changes in science attitudes and why? Okay, and the last one was what they had learned. But um, it's, we have to include that for a paper, but you know, because everybody wants it, but it's not the most important thing here. So Deanna and Amber, they understood some things about predator-prey relationships. Amber had interest in the oceans. She knew about all the plastics in the oceans and that bothered her because those kill some of the animals. Um, and they both thought about themselves as good students and interested in science. So they were drawn in by the science. They took initiative to explore, and they saw themselves doing science as they did that. Um, Ecomo's responsiveness to their curiosity kept them engaged in the beginning and all the way through. And, um, and they were persistent um, and took advantage of that autonomy that they were given. So, um, you know, they see themselves as good students and interested in science. And, you know, this is what you'd expect from people who are good students and interested in science if the, if the system is responsive to them and allows them to do this. Um, they remained engaged due to the autonomy they were given, the challenging task that, you know, really kept them energized, um, and all the options that they had to explore. Um, and, you know, they reported that it allowed them to be the scientists that they thought they were. Okay, um, delights and surprises. It engaged Amber's interest in the ocean. Um, these guys were, these were some, uh, one of the sets in what I showed you who were so surprised at the role of human intervention in making these awful things happen. Um, so um, surprised that humans can do so much damage. 
Um, they love the microscopic organisms and um, the virtual world felt so real. Okay, so those were the things they reported to us as being just delightful. Okay, um, there are changes in science attitudes. So they both developed real interest in ecosystems and expressed that they wanted to explore others. Um, they liked using the tools of scientists. They told us that and wanted to do more of that. Um, they became more concerned about pollution and were glad they now had some tools to measure it, they told us. <coughs> and uh, Jason and Yumika, uh, names were all changed. Don't worry. First initials are the same. But. So uh, Yumika loves animals. Jason fishes a lot. Um, they both have, you know, a lot of stick to itiveness. They they both pers persi persist, and uh, they both want to be successful, and they're both very curious. So Jason, <clears throat> I suppose, uh, plays games. Jason plays games. He was really excited that they would have a mission, and he was particularly looking forward. He said at the very beginning to a mission <coughs> where he'd be able to do something to save the world. But he didn't get to do that. He only got to explain. And he's interested in fish and ponds. So those things drew him in. And Yumika loved that there were so many resources about animals. Okay? And they both in the beginning looked forward to finding clues and solving the mystery. What kept them in? The responsiveness of the system, the set of resources, as I set up here, that for finding things out that they were interested in and for figuring things out. They really liked the graphs. Um, um, uh, Jason really liked finding out more about fish and water. Um, they wanted to solve the mystery. They kept at it, okay? Um, and, um, and they had this particular interest in predator-prey relationships, um, and they were learning more about it, okay? Um, delights and surprises. This one's slightly different than the other one. I think you saw it before. How one little organism or bacteria or a real little organism in the world can affect the population of a whole lot of animals. Ah! So the complexity of water life and all that's in it that we can't see with the naked eye. Um, and uh, Jason was ready to use what he learned to explore the world next time he went fishing. Okay, that, if you, you, I don't know if you saw this one. I think you saw the Barbados one. I, I'm not sure. Maybe you saw this one. Um, Andre and Amara. Uh, you saw them. Andre's a really good student. I mean, Amara's a really good student. Andre is not. He is one of these kids who's not going to learn because it's not cool to learn and he's not interested in learning. Um, but Andre is a gamer, okay, and he travels to Barbados often, has a lot of beach and water experience. Um, they both like interacting with others, and Amara feels pulled to science, but not the way it's done in school. Okay, so Andre was drawn in, he immediately, he doesn't get drawn into anything in school. Okay, he was immediately began exploring the environment and wanted to be successful at the game. Amara does what she's told, so she was drawn in. Um, they were kept in. They both enjoyed navigating the environment and its responsiveness. Amara particularly enjoyed the underwater world. They both enjoyed interacting with the avatars and both wanted more of that. Um, Andre enjoyed being expert at moving around in the environment and finding things out. Um, he was disengaged from the science, but at some point, the teacher announced that their grades depended on what both pairs were able to contribute, what but both people in the pair were able to contribute and not just what one of them could. He didn't want to let Amara down, and he immediately became interested and actually did a very nice job, okay? Delights and surprises. They both liked, to, they could learn the science through exploration and game like play. They both liked that they could learn science their way rather than being told. I mean, they told us, they told us this. Andre was applauded when he contributed to a class presentation. It's not the normal thing for him. And he was surprised to find out, like, I'm mean, an expert finding information. It's so cool to present to the class. So this was a big deal for him. And he was really delightfully grossed out by the stuff in the water. Okay. I mean, he's like going like this, you know, when he talked about it. My three-year-old granddaughter does this, but you know, but he was doing like the three-year-old granddaughter. 
through changes in science attitudes. Amar was really happy to find that science could be engaging and interactive as she had imagined. It wasn't like that in school. Um, the virtual world inspired Andre's curiosity about the real world. He said, it gave me ideas. Oh, you, I read that too already. Um, um, Andre became excited about the challenge of science. I think like with science, when you see something that's challenging, it can get you frustrated, but at the same time, you just laugh at it because it's pushing you to think harder and harder about what you have to do. So uh, Andre, you might guess, is my favorite because he like went from no interest to wow. <laughs> Um, and I want to talk about Asher and Renata. I hadn't talked about them before. Um, they, um, they came in, they're very quiet in the back of the room. Um, they came in with simple predator-prey knowledge, interest in mysteries and ideas about how detectives do their work. They both read mystery stories. Um, Renata reads a lot about Sherlock Holmes. She reads a lot of Sherlock Holmes stories. And they both think of themselves as problem solvers. They were drawn in by the mystery. You know, they were going to get to be detectives. Okay, they were kept in by the responsiveness of the system to their style. And by the way, their style was way more piecemeal than anybody else's. They were not very, um, they, weren't, they weren't very organized in what they were looking for as they went along. They were just looking at a lot of stuff and writing it all down. And they think detectives do that and then they pull it all together. You know, they read and they watch TV shows. Um, they really like the tools and resources, and, and the system allowed doing it either way. I mean, this is like similar to Turkle and Papert's talk about epistemological pluralism. This, the system supported epistemological pluralism. Um, the tools and resources that allowed them, they like the tools and resources that allow them to find out and keep track and visualize like detectives do. And they always have feelings of progress, making progress. Um, their delights and surprises, their feelings of accomplishment, they were really awed by how quickly a stable ecosystem could become so highly unbalanced. I should put, I should put quotation marks around that because that was the way they said it. And the speed of change. Um, they really liked the patterns of population growth and death, how interconnected an ecosystem is. Um, environment, mental balance was something that was really interesting to them. Too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. And science, and came to think about science as putting puzzle pieces together every time I got a different clue, and then they talk about it. So, like, they, you know, they, they were they were good students. They would have been, they would have been fine with whatever they were doing, but they got really excited because this 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 line between detective and scientist was like not there, right? They got they really they, they got there. So, um, so, so they. Their change in science attitudes, um, they both began to think of science as inquiry and detective work. Okay, I'm almost done. It's late. Is it late? Oh, okay, so I want to go back to our questions. Um, this question is actually a combination of two of the questions that I had in those four. Why did the students become so substantially interested in this world and this challenge? And why did they so willingly and purposefully engage in science practices even after the unit was over? And I got one, two, three, four, five reasons there. So let me just say something about them. So the first one is, and I don't have any analysis of this yet, but the first one is that you could see um, they were basically all drawn into the mystery. Okay? Um, whether it was through an interest in science, through an interest in gaming, or through an interest in detective work. I mean, mystery goes a long way. Okay, and that organic movement between mystery solving and scientific problem solving was particularly, um, that was particularly uh, important for uh, Andre the Gamer, right, and for um, um, Renata and the last two I, to I told you about. I can't remember what name I gave them, Asher and Renata. I remember their real names. Um, they, um, they had autonomy and the support to go with it. That certainly contributed to their, uh, uh, them becoming so substantially interested and continuing to want to. Um, the authenticity of the experience, I'm going to explain what, these, what these, these three mean. And those experiences of wonder, awe, and pride and accomplishment. 
And I think that the other thing is that the, that our respect for them and our want to interact with them about what they had experienced and to know what they learned was something that was engaging for them. Um, I said I would say this, you should remind me if I didn't say it, because I'm not going to talk anymore about it. Um, um, I can't remember who, but one of the groups didn't feel like they had made, it might be the one I didn't show you, but didn't feel like they had made a lot of progress and they were kind of disengaged. But when we started asking them about it, they realized they knew more now, having studied for the test and having heard from the teacher than they knew before. And they went right back in and started reasoning through it and, you know, and were spot on. Right? It wasn't spot on because they remember what the teacher said. You don't remember that stuff, right? They, it was spot on because there was, because, because they had learned things in between and now they were able to use them. Okay. But, but, I, but you know, the fact that we wanted to know played, played a role in that. So I'm going to talk about the, these three. I'm going to say some things about them. So um, first one I want to talk about is support for autonomy. Okay, so they were let go. You know, they could go and mostly let go. Um, they could go and explore the world. Um, you know, they had things to do at particular times, but they, 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 they could explore the world. And um, without an autonomy, you know, wouldn't have been so, wouldn't have felt so good if they didn't also feel like they were being successful, right? And, um, and here's where I start telling you about all the things that are right about the way the EcoMove was designed, okay? The autonomy, the teacher gave it to, teachers gave it to them. Teachers get credit for that. The, um, all the support, the, most of the support, I should say, um, the software gets credit for that. It also gets credit for having posed a mystery, okay, that had so many different ways of getting into it. Um, so it invited exploration and supported exploration and purposeful inquiry, easy navigation through time, space, and perspective. I told you about the calendar. I didn't tell you about the arrow keys, but they use arrow keys to move around in the environment. Uh, I don't even remember what the difference between arrow keys and the cursor. There were these magnification tools, and they had some superpowers. Like they could go underwater two different ways. I didn't tell you they could walk underwater without drowning. They could also uh, they also had the submarine, right? That's a superpower. Okay. Um, the tools were ready, readily available. The tools and resources when they wanted and needed them. And there were a lot of those resources. And, uh, uh, the tools and resources. There was a field guide. There were data collection tools. The field guide told them about all the different animals and trees, um, um, and all the, all the organisms, I should say. Data collection tools, charts and graphs, and the virtual agents. I didn't show you any of those. Um, they had genuine responsibility for explaining and arguing, and they used each other to do that. But they needed to figure it out and convince their peers, and they used each other to do that. And that's part of the teacher setting up the classroom so that they could easily do that. Um, it was all appropriate. The support was all appropriate to what they were ready for and familiar with. Okay, and it worked for them whether or not they were systematic in what they did. The authenticity of the experience. Well, I, I, for some for some amount of time, I didn't let ever didn't let my students talk about authenticity because what's it mean, right? But um, but the, uh, David Schaefer and uh, Mitch Resnick wrote a paper back I don't know ninety eight perhaps called Thick Authenticity where they talk about authenticity from the point uh, authenticity having to do with you're giving learners a challenge to work on okay and they are people who come into it and they bring their selves okay and the things that they're asked to do being you know truthful to authentic I, I don't I, I need to say it without saying authentic but being right for the challenge okay so the challenge spoke to their varied identities and dispositions, you know, good students, scientists, as you would expect, but also gamer and detective. Okay, so there's, you know, authentic to who they are. <coughs> um, they have the ability to do what seems natural and they had material support for each. You know, all these things that, 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 that made it so engaging. I mean, they're related to each other, but, you know, I'm trying to, to sort it all out. Um, the responsiveness and availability of resources, again, 
made it authentic, I mean, that was authentic to what they were asked to do, right? Um, it was real with respect to issues in the world um, that they may encounter, like, um, you know, like pollution in the oceans, right? Plastics in the oceans. And at the same time, appropriate to their developmental level and what they knew, um, they had opportunities to try out ideas with others, and their interactions with others really mattered. Okay, that's what authentic means. It matters to what you're doing. Um, and the wonder of all of it was new to them. And I like to say that um, as scientists, um, the wonder of all of it is something that uh, keeps us in, keeps us engaged, gets us very excited. You know, I see these kids getting very excited and I forget that I get very excited too and they're just like being me, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I, you know, I start out with these cold cognition ideas. This is not the first time I did it. And then it turns out the hot cognition, the real excitement is, is the thing. So the wonder of all of it that's new to them is also authentic. And it's consistent with Schaefer and Resnick's ideas of thick authenticity and Barab's and his students' ideas about consequential games. Um, then there were these experiences of wonder and awe. Okay, that goes with the authenticity. But they experienced a full range of emotions that make life worth living, right? They experienced wonder and awe, and they experienced surprise and curiosity and frustration, and they got over it, right? And pride and accomplishment. I mean, and you know, those are authentic to what scientists do, but they're also the things that, that keep us engaged. So let me go to the question of what made the virtual world feel so real. And the same answers are there, right? I mean, I already told you, right? It supported their autonomy. It, it provided them tools they needed for authenticity. And they had, it gave them those opportunities to experience wonder and awe and pride and accomplishment, right? Gave them the, the opportunities to experience those. I think that for me, you know, everybody when they design something, design these things, thinks about these, I shouldn't say everybody, Mostly when people do these, build these kinds of virtual worlds, they're, they're, they're aiming towards su support for people being able to be successful and for the experience to be authentic. Lots of games out there like that. But the opportunities to experience wonder and awe and pride and accomplishment, I mean, that's not something people always think about when they're designing, when they're designing experiences for learners. Um, this is my last slide. What made them want to explore the real world more closely? Well, I think it was a bunch of things tied to each other. Um, um, I think the really important one is that there were connections they were able to make between what they were experiencing and with EcoMove and their own real life interests and experiences. Okay, the oceans having all the plastic in them and that killing the animals. <coughs> um, the kid who goes fishing, the kid who goes to Barbados. Um, a bunch of the kids, they live near um, Jamaica Pond and they walk around Jamaica Pond. So they, they um, you know, they, they spend time around water. Um, so I think that, that that's an important thing. Um, I think the thing that, that makes this happen is, first of all, the realism and the authenticity of all of it. So the realism of the experience connected it to the real world their ability to explore what seemed like a real world and their autonomy to do that and responsiveness to the real world, you know, it, that was an important thing in, in, in making them feel like uh, they were learning something that could connect to the world around them. And again, the, that awe and wonder that they experienced in the realistic virtual world, they're looking forward to experiencing that in the real world. So it's different for each of the kids, but it seems to be some combination of these, plus more that I can't identify. So that's my last slide. I'm sorry I went over, so far over, because um, I really wanted to have time to talk. But um, that's my last slide, and I hope that I was able to tell you two stories without <laughs> them getting confused with each other. Thank you. We do have time for a few questions if folks would like to talk to Janice more about the study. Yeah. So um, I don't remember when it was, but I think it was when the software was 
early in development, Chris Didi visited he here mm -hmm. and talked to the folks here at the center a little bit about what they were doing. And I was wondering if, if they did implement this idea that I think he communicated to us, which was that the students were doing things uh, in their classrooms to learn how to use measuring devices, which would, would then kind of unlock abilities in the uh, in the simulator. And I was wondering, it sounded like that might have been connected I don't, I don't to. I remember anything. Yeah, that, that. didn't. Yeah, yeah, I don't remember it, anything like that. But these teachers did not use it exactly the way that, you know, that he would have wanted to it use it. It went in a different direction. Yeah, also, um, you know, what happens in the life of something like this is you have all these things that you think are going to happen, and then you go into the real world and you find out that you're not as good a designer as you thought you were, and you can't put your head yourself inside the head of the teachers or the kids, you know, the way that you thought you could. So things go by the base wayside and you find better things That's by looking design. at the way yeah. it's done. So, I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Can you speak to the complexity of making Eco Move? Is it, a, was it 10 people over two years, uh, two people over a week and a half? You know? They've, uh, more like 10 people over two years. Um, they're still, I mean, I'm not involved in making Eco Move. I was just yeah, using it. Um, so, um, they've been working on variations of it for probably close to 10 years now. Maybe only like eight years. So it's a non-trivial. It's non-trivial. Building these things is non-trivial. Yeah. But if we know more about what they need to have in them, okay, then you can start having authoring systems that make it easier. So I think that so I think that you know the first ones are always way harder to build than the ones that come later. Um, this issue of whether um, of the kids not really learning enough about the content of the science, um, they didn't really want them to. They weren't really aiming for their kids to learn a lot about the content of the science in here. They wanted them to be able to make good causal explanations that that went over you know went over time and time and space, time and place. But um, but they started looking at what it would take for them to you know to better really understand ecosystems. Um, <clears throat> they've got a newer version of it that um, that I like very much. That continues with the same conceit that this is the pond we're at, and you're you're scientists and whatever. And in order to support them in actually learning more about the science, um, they have a um, they have a trailer, a lab trailer on the site where the kids can go in and they can do experiments, they can build models, they can try just pulling a few of the things from the ecosystem into buckets and see what happens. So um, so that's, that's pretty nice. I think they're still missing the thing that helps the kids to visualize the whole thing going together, but, but I, I'm, I haven't had a chance yet to write the proposal to to find that out. I, I, I mean, I've talked to them about getting my own programmers and adding that to them to see. Yeah. If a teacher were interested in using that in their class, how would they go about doing that? Is it, is it something? Yeah, just go, to the, just go to the Harvard um, website. It doesn't cost anything. It doesn't cost anything either. No, they have, um, they have several different ecosystem worlds. There's also a forest <coughs> world, and I think yeah, there's one more. Like, yeah. Is it scale up in different developmental stages, such as a middle school no. or a high school, just at the middle school level? Just for middle school level. I, it, it's interesting. I have to tell you that I was, I played with it before we took it out into the, I, I wrote, I wrote that aspirational um, uh, example based on having seen Chris demo it and having all kinds of ideas about what was in it. That, that, were, that wasn't there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then when I actually played with it, I was super disappointed, you know, that it was, it just wasn't that sophisticated. But like, I'm not a middle school. Yeah. And the middle schoolers were so excited. And I, you know, I always pride myself in being able to see things through the eyes of a middle schooler, but I totally failed in that, <laughs> totally failed.
Is it only been done in sixth grade, or did you scale it up? To um, I think it's been done throughout middle school. Okay. Any differences as you move up towards middle I, I I don't know. I'm not an expert on the Google. Yeah. So as a science teacher educator, one of the things I always struggle with in using simulations is sort of the benefits and the challenges of using <laughs> simulations or virtual worlds to represent nature. And I want to kind of pick out one of the things that you that you mentioned was kind of a result of the content was the fact that the students had difficulty with time scale. Yeah. And so I wondered if you can talk a little bit about what role simulations kind of play in that kind of misconceptions of time scale with large, complex scientific problems like ecosystems. Yeah, That's something I, was I, think, with as well. I think they didn't have misconceptions about time scale so much as they didn't know how to deal with it. Yeah. Okay. You can do things in these programs where well, the data is already there that you're pulling yeah, it out. So it takes a long the, time as a scientist to gather that information. And so that's right. They, and here these they, kids, were they think that it's instant, it. right? But then, like in nature, it takes scientists years to, well, to find out. Well, you these know, phenomena. that's right. But they mm -hmm. got that things were happening on different days. But then, when they looked at the graph and they were looking at patterns in the graph, yeah. they weren't. The time was. It was. It was time in the graph that they just didn't know how to deal with. Yeah. Not all of them, Yeah. but most of them. Um, they, they now, the, the new system, EcoXPT, not only has the lab in it, but it gives continuous data. Mm. So you can query the graphs that have the data to see what the dates were on them. Um, I mean, you also can go and look at different days and see what the data is. You yeah. can still still do that, but it's more continuous data. Um, I mean, there was a the, the problem here that I thought made it confusing was that um, that the different dates that they chose to put in there. Well, look, there was a couple. It was a couple of days before the fish died, and then the next one was like the day after, or a couple of days after the fish died. So what you saw was the oxygen disappear and the fish. The oxygen was at its lowest right at the point where they where they had the previous to the fish died at the, at the point previous to when the fish died and then it was already going up by the time they saw their next data point because the fish had died somewhere in between and the um, the the um, bacteria that was eating up all of the um, Bacteria that was using all of the all of the oxygen in eating the, uh, there was a um, what's it called an algae bloom eating the algae bloom yeah. that the, those bacteria the algae bloom was gone the bacteria weren't so yeah. numerous anymore so the oxygen was going up so that was really quite confusing to them um, and I, I and you know from my point of view I think the only way you can deal with that one is to make the data better. Yeah. Right. I mean, that was just something that was built into it. And I, this is what I'm saying about, I was saying that I think that the one more thing that they need besides the continuous data and besides the, the lab, the, the lab um, trailer was um, giving the kids a chance to see, to see how all these things interact with each other, to see yeah to see the different data points change over time and see what it looks like in, a, in an animation, what it looks like when that's happening. Mm -hmm. I just don't believe that the kids can do that, that the, that the kids can do that. Um, and I don't believe they should have to do that. I mean, think about how scientists reason. They run mental models. That's a real big thing that they do, mm -hmm. okay? But they have to have experience things previously or know an awful lot about it to be able to run those mental models. The kids don't have any way to run those models. So uh, my idea is that, um, that we have to give the kids, if we really want them to understand the causality well, we have to give them the kinds of resources that scientists have to be able to understand the causality well, and that is some way to run the model being the most important one of those. So I have you. Could, if you guys want to steal that from me and write a proposal down, that's fine. Because I don't know when I'm going to have time. So I was talking about it to several people a couple of years ago, and then just never got back to it. So, um, but I but I think that that's that that's a really important thing. 
and you know they so that they can be drawn in and they can they can learn a lot at the same time. <coughs> yeah. So um, I have a question uh, about the like the concept and the game is the outdoor education. So so my question is, what do you think? How does that concept play in your research? Like for example, if the same concept is given inside the lab that student can you know work around the lab and do this. Do you think it can create a difference? Well, um, well, the guys at Harvard have, the people at Harvard have done some work on that. So they have a piece of software called, oh gosh, I don't remember what it's called, but it's an augmented reality thing where they can go to the lake and they go to this lake. Well, the ones, the kids who live near this lake, right? They go to this lake um, and they do real measurements in the lake. Um, and then they also have this augmented reality tool that, you know, if they see a certain kind of fish there, they can use the augmented reality tool to help them know more about the fish. Or if they're using some, um, they're using, they can, they can see, t see time go by if they go went there once and then they go there the next week or the next week. They can see, they can see time go by on a graph, right, with, with, um, the data that they're collecting. So, so they're augmenting what's there. Um, they've tried it out with um, eco move first and then go and do the augmented reality thing. They've tried it out the other way and they've tried it out with just going out and having the augmented reality. I don't remember what they're, what they found. I think we're at 5.30, so we're gonna wrap up. We can thank Janet again. I'm sure if any of you want to ask her a question one on one, she'd be happy to chat with you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah.